A few months back, I built this interesting prototype for an omnidirectional treadmill. Depending on the angle I tilt these rotating discs, the platform on top can move in any direction. The one thing that really held this design back from being truly great is that we have to use a really wide platform like this to ensure that it's always supported by multiple discs. You can see that a smaller platform like this will just get stuck. In fact, even this large platform isn't actually big enough and it'll still slip between the discs if I move it into just the wrong spot. The solution, of course, is to use much smaller discs, and a lot of them, to cover the same area while having a lot more points of contact. The smaller I can make the discs, the more this will really feel like one cohesive floor that can slide in any direction. If I was going to do this, I wanted to take this idea as far as I could and make the smallest tilting discs possible within the LEGO system. That meant using these one by one tiles, since they're no bigger than the universal joints I need to have under each of them to let me rotate them regardless of what angle they're tilted at. We really can't get much more compact than this. So going from 6x6 to 1x1 discs like this, we'll be able to move around objects as small as this, as opposed to the massive platform we had to use before. To make this work, I knew I'd have two major challenges. To design some kind of holder mechanism that lets me control which direction all of these discs tilt in, and to power every single one of these discs, remembering of course that they all have to be rotating in the same direction. I honestly thought that the first of these challenges was going to be the toughest to solve, given that the mechanisms I used on the original treadmill to control the angle, which are these holders under the discs that can rotate in two different axes, are really big. But I really didn't see how I could make a design like this much smaller out of Lego, let alone one by one small. That all changed when a very smart commenter had the brilliant idea of using a Lego net piece. And what a good idea it turned out to be, so a massive thank you for that. The crisscrossed ropes fit perfectly between the discs and let me guide all of them in any direction. And since the discs naturally want to fall one way or the other, it's fine that we don't have a perfectly rigid connection between the net and the discs, as they'll want to stay tilted in whatever direction we've pushed them into. One thing to note is that this kind of set the scale for the size of this mini treadmill, as I'm going to call it. The net piece has 10x10 10 10 slots, so that kind of limits the treadmill to this size. I could probably use overlapping nets like this to expand it, but for the moment I'm going to stick to this 10x10 10 10 grid. Which brings me to that second challenge. Every axle in this 10x10 10 10 grid has to be individually powered to power all the discs, and they all have to be rotating in the same direction. Little did I know that getting this one function to work would be the cause of literal months of head scratching and tried and failed ideas and designs. But after a lot of work, this is what I came up with. There were a lot of twists and turns in the process to finally reach this solution, so let's dive right in. My most basic idea was just to throw down a whole grid of gears. That was what I did on the original treadmill design, but since we need all discs to rotate the same way, we need what are called idler gears between each disc, since two meshing gears will rotate in opposite directions. So if you imagine this is just one quarter of the full 10x10 10 10 grid we'll need to power the mini treadmill, on this, half of the gears are rotating the wrong way, so they're basically just functioning as idler gears. These 8 tooth gears are the smallest gears LEGO makes, so using this approach the best we can do is to only have one of every two gears being used to power discs. Obviously, I wouldn't still be able to use the 1x1 one one discs here since it leaves all of these holes where discs can't be powered, but technically this could work if I found bigger discs which are about 1.4 studs wide, but a treadmill like that would have been really inferior to the version I'll go on to make in this video where every axle gets powered, especially since we're limited to that 10x10 size because of the net piece. Next up I thought, what if we had two layers of gears like this? The bottom layer gives us half of the axles rotating the right way, and then we drive the missing spots on this upper layer. But to power these upper gears, we'd really need a gear like this, where the gear itself can rotate independently of the axle passing through its centre, but at the same size as these 8 tooth gears. But sadly, no such piece exists. I had the slightly wacky idea of replacing the grey axles with these thin rods, since regular 8 tooth gears can slide around them freely, and so we could use them to power the inner gears, but then how do we make sure the bottom gears don't slide on them? I guess I could glue them in place, but at this point I realised I was just drifting further and further into silliness with this idea. So instead of gears, I thought about what mechanisms can rotate two adjacent axles in the same direction, since that's what we're trying to do. The two main options are belts and chains. 
The one benefit of belts is that I can connect them to axles directly next to each other, which isn't the case with chains. However, even the smallest size of LEGO rubber bands are too big for this, and I'd have to connect it round four axles instead to make sure the band stays taut. But since the band is only in contact with a quarter of the pulleys on each axle, there isn't much grip at all, and I can easily stop the axles. Also, just using this single rubber band, there's already a lot more friction than you'd expect, so there's absolutely no way I'd be able to use 25 of these to power the full 10x10 grid. This really showed that LEGO's own rubber bands really just don't work that well as belts like this. But, knowing that belts still had a lot of potential in compact areas like this, I thought I'd try out some non-LEGO rubber bands. These tiny, transparent rubber bands, if you can see them at all, turned out to be a perfect fit. It's a bit of a tight fit getting them round two axles, but because of that, they're really grippy, surprisingly so, to the point that I thought these could be strong enough to power every single axle for the treadmill. Also, they've got way, way less friction than the LEGO rubber bands did, probably because their inside surface is flat, as opposed to the rounded LEGO bands. Seems perfect, right? Well, unfortunately, even if there's low friction when we're driving a single one of these belts, that friction will add up really fast once we've got a hundred of these, which is what we'll need to power all a hundred axles in the 10x10 grid. To get a feel for how much friction we'd actually be dealing with, I used the rubber bands to power this 5x5 grid of axles. I know they're pretty hard to see, but they're all there. So, this uses 24 bands, and accounts for a quarter of the full grid. And just giving it a quick turn manually, there's unfortunately a ton of friction, and you can see that the majority of the axles don't even turn. The way I've configured this here is that the rubber bands couple each of these five axles together, and then these are each coupled to every axle along these rows. So turning this back right one, after just one or two axles of transmission, the rubber bands do just start slipping, and the rest of the axles don't turn. So based on this configuration, this axle will be able to power the most other axles before the bands start slipping, but even this way, only about half of them turn, and there's still a huge amount of friction. So instead of driving every axle directly with these belts, I thought back to that grid of gears I tried before. Since only half the axles could be used, as the other half are rotating the wrong way, we could use these belts only to fill in the gaps, by driving each axle off of one of these that's already powered by the gears below. This means each belt now only needs to drive one axle, so we shouldn't run into any slipping issues. And trying to turn it, yeah, now every axle does rotate, but man there's a lot of friction, to the point that it felt like these gears were about to snap. Given that this is just one quarter of the full grid, and even this way, when I tried driving it with a motor, with a big gear reduction, the motor stalled within a few seconds, I knew that this idea wouldn't be the way forward. I will say though, these belts still are great for compact mechanisms like this, and as a small spoiler, they ended up playing a crucial role in the final design. So, I've left a link to them down in the description, I'm not affiliated or anything, but I'm sure some of you might find them helpful in your own builds. They come in batches of a thousand, so you'll have plenty of spares, and you'll probably need them, because if you drop one of these, chances are it's lost forever. So, after that, I went back to see if chains would be a better option. A big benefit of chains is that they'll never slip, but unfortunately we can't place the two sprockets directly next to each other, as they'll just mesh, which will stop them from rotating in the same direction. So instead, I thought about using one long chain to power a whole bunch of axles at once. I can't put gears in every position, since they'd end up meshing, but I can fit in half the positions, and then use a second layer with a second chain to power the other positions. Immediately though, it turned out this idea was fundamentally flawed, because the teeth of these eight tooth gears are actually too short to connect to the chain links, so the chain just slides right past them. But if I go up to the larger 12 tooth gears like this, sure, the chain drives these five positions, but the gears are too big to fit between the axles for the second layer, so again we'd be stuck only powering half of the axles. And also, fitting 10 rows of these next to each other probably wouldn't be the easiest job. Next, I thought that, even though the chain links can't power these 8 tooth gears, a gear rack certainly can. So maybe I could create a belt lined with these gear racks to continuously brush past the gears. But, with a quick proof of concept version, I could tell that this wasn't going to be a viable design. And of course, extending this to multiple rows of axles would be extremely tough. So finally, what did I come up with? 
Well, I thought about what if instead of trying to power all 100 axles with a single repeating mechanism, I segment the full 10x10 grid into chunks and then design a mechanism that just powers every single axle within one chunk. Then I just need to make sure the chunks can fit seamlessly next to one another and we'll have our full grid powered. It was pretty clear from the start that 3x3 chunks would be the way to go here. That's because just using 5 gears in a cross shape like this, I'll already have 4 of the 9 axles rotating the right way, which just leaves these 4 corners and the centre to work on. 3x3 chunks does unfortunately mean the full grid will have to be 9x9 instead of 10x10, but this really was the best option. So let's start work on it. For the four corner positions, I realised I could just run a line of gears in a C-shaped round like this, to get all four corners rotating the same way. Now I'll just add on another frame to the bottom. So now, turning the central axle drives the four grey axles, and turning the second axle drives the four corners. Note that, for the eight axles to rotate all the same way, these two driving axles need to rotate in opposite directions. That means we need to connect them with a single pair of gears, as gears in an L shape like this will rotate the same way. So what options do we have? 8 tooth gears are too small, and the next size up 12 tooth gears are just slightly too big. They'd mesh perfectly with a 0.5 stud gap, but here we've got a 0.4 stud gap, so they're just barely too big, so there's a lot of friction trying to turn them. I first tried just meshing them further out, so the axles have room to spread out a little, Definitely not a legal building technique, and it means the axles aren't as secure, but more importantly, there's still a lot of friction because the gears are being squashed together. You may not think it's that big a deal, but since we'll have 9 of these chunks, every bit of friction counts. I tried every combination of the different 12 tooth gear variations, spur, double bevel, even single bevel, but they all had too much friction. So finally, I decided if these gears want to be 0.5 studs apart, I'll make them 0.5 studs apart. I connected one of them through a universal joint, and built this holder to keep the gears at just the right distance apart. Is it compact? No. Is it over-engineered? Maybe, a little. Does it work though? Yes. And when I've got 9 of these next to each other, I'm betting it'll look pretty cool. There's almost no friction, and by driving the central axle, all 8 of the surrounding ones rotate in the correct direction. That just leaves the central axle, which, if I were to just drive it up straight from the bottom, would be rotating the wrong way. And this was where those tiny rubber bands were the absolute perfect fit, and since I'm only using one of them in each chunk, we'll only have a total of 9 of them in the full grid, so they won't add much friction at all. With this one chunk completed, we just need to make sure these chunks can fit seamlessly next to one another to form the full grid. You may have noticed that, above each set of gears, I've left a layer of bushings like this. Then, on the next chunk, I'll swap round the position of the gears and the bushings, and that way, none of the gears will run into each other. This will be clearer to see now as I assemble the full grid. This is the lower layer of gears, in those C-shapes I explained before, to power the corner axles of each chunk. And you can see that they're arranged in this checkerboard pattern, so that the gears of each chunk don't interlock. Next, I'm securing it in place, and from that, I've added on the second layer of gears, in the cross shapes to power all the grey axles. And now, I've added on the final layer, with those tiny rubber bands to power the central axle of each chunk. And then, flipping it upside down, I've now added on all the pairs of 12 tooth gears. And now, I've added on the housings to hold all those gears in place, with this intricate assembly. I've now added these gear trains to drive all the central axles. And after building a proper support frame, I can throw on the motors to power each of those three gear trains. With that all done, let's give it a quick test. So each of these axles will have one of these tilting disc assemblies on top of it. But first, I've got to design a mechanism to move around the net piece that will be tilting all of them. To do that, I built this frame that lets the net housing slide in both directions, and in order to control this movement, I designed this joystick mechanism, which separates out the joystick's motion into its components in each direction, which independently drive each of these two sets of linkages. And after a bit of work, I managed to link up the joystick to the net assembly, so I can easily control its movement in both directions. And I've also added an on-off switch for the motors.
you may have noticed that the direction the net moves is actually shifted by 90 degrees to the direction I point the joystick. That's entirely by design, and it's part of the reason I had to use so many linkages like this. You see, on any treadmill like this, if we say the discs are rotating clockwise for example, then if I tilt them forwards, the top edge of the discs are moving this way, so any object on them will move to the right. And similarly, if I tilt them left, the discs will now move any object this way. So you can see, on this version, where the discs tilt in the same direction as the joystick, the direction the platform moves is shifted round by 90 degrees, which is really counterintuitive and hard to control. Whereas here, I've coupled it so the direction I point the joystick is actually the direction the treadmill will move, even though the net moves a different way. And to show that, the last job was to finally connect on all those tiny tilting discs. Well, that's the video. I'm really happy with how this turned out, and while there are loads more tests I'd like to do with it, I think those will fit best in another video. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.